You are listening to the Visualizing War podcast. In each episode, we talk about representations of war in art, text, film, and music. With new guests each time, we look at how people have described or imagined war in different periods and places, and we discuss the impact which war stories have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Nicholas Vieter. And my name is Alice Koenig. And we co-direct the Visualizing War project at the University of St. Andrews. Our guest today is artist and author Harry Parker. Harry grew up in a military family. He went to art school straight after finishing his secondary schooling. And following that, he joined the British Army, serving both in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was badly injured in Afghanistan and turned to writing as well as painting during his recovery. We have invited him onto the podcast to talk about lots of things, but in particular, his remarkable book, Anatomy of a Soldier, a novel that tells the fictional story of Captain Tom Barnes, who gets seriously injured, much as Harry did when he steps on an IED. So Harry, we are absolutely delighted to have you on the show today. Hello and welcome to the Visualizing War podcast. Thanks, Nicholas. Thanks, Alice. Thanks very much for having me. It's a real honor. We'll dive into your writing and also talk a bit more about your art in, uh, in just a minute. But uh, could you give us and our listeners um, a bit of uh, background information um, about yourself? So um, we'd love to hear how you ended up going to art school before joining the army, for example. That sounds like a, like a bit of an unusual uh, trajectory, but also we're interested in your time at the army itself and particularly what happened in Afghanistan. Yeah, sure. So I mean, people often say that, that it's unusual to have a sort of Art, feel sort of creative and artistic and then end up in the army and I I think it probably is quite unusual but not as unusual as people think and I, I think I'm a pretty normal story I was um, not badly but a bit dyslexic when I was at school and I found it much easier to be in the art department and the design department than I did um, in the sort of English or maths department and so that's where I sort of gravitated and spent most of my time and then I suppose I was lucky in a way with the sort of education I was having that my my parents said yeah sure you can do art and design and history of art A levels um you know the world's your oyster sort of thing and and then the plan was always to go on and become a fine artist I think that was all my always my dream but I ended up um I did an art foundation course in Falmouth Falmouth College of Art and then I actually went on to University College London to do history of art uh, and it was there that I sort of loved the subject but also when I left I sort of was looking around for things to do and and like lots of lots of people um my my family have a, a very sort of strong military connection I think um by the time I'd left the military there'd been somebody serving from my family for over 100 years whether it's navy marines or, or or um or army so yes um so that was the sort of tra trajectory and I and I yeah, I'm not sure why I sort of ended up joining. It was nothing I, you know, it was never, it was never, I never went, I never did cadets and I never did the uh, training corps at the university. Um, but it was, it was something that I think I'd always had in the back of my mind as something I might like to do. So yeah, I joined the army. I went through Sandhurst, did the officer training year long course there and then joined the infantry uh, in the rifles. And then very, very quickly went from the the infantry training course in Brecon straight to Basra uh, as a platoon commander, which was a sort of really was a sort of baptism of fire. I was commanding a platoon of uh, 30 riflemen uh, in, in, in a city of two million people with with four armoured vehicles. And that was a huge, um, huge eye opener really. And, and, and we were very privileged in a way to have all the sort of military assets that you could ever want as a as a young platoon commander um and also fighting uh, or, or so fighting might be the, the, the wrong word but we were doing quite a lot of fighting in, in an area that you know we probably weren't you know that wasn't the intention for why we were there and it was also very politically difficult to understand what was going on and then I came back and uh did a sort of normal cycle I suppose of operational training before then deploying to Afghanistan uh, and I actually deployed to Afghanistan as a as an influence officer which is a slightly sort of strange title but it was a sort of captain's job and the idea was to uh, my role for the company was to try and understand the local tribal dynamics and population and, and 
essentially try to understand what was going on so we could be more effective at in the area that we were in. But about eight weeks, I think it was, into the deployment, that's when I was injured. And it was a fairly usual story. I was, we were on a foot patrol and had, as ever, the sort of influence that I was meant to be doing, sort of surers and chatting to the local population. Most of the influence that we ended up doing was with our rifles and in firefights. And it was a morning of coming back from, from we were trying to sort of, trying to sort of ambush the enemy and as ever they weren't there. And, and then on the way back, I was injured by stepping on an IED and, and then it was a sort of fairly normal, um, normal story from there of being sort of Kazavaks back to the UK. So in, the, in a way, the idea to join the army that came as part of the family tradition, something that was there, then obviously you turned back to art and uh, writing. So it was probably very good that you did this degree before joining the army so it could help you then through the difficult times that were lying ahead of you when you when you were injured. Yeah, I, I mean, it's very hard. Some, sometimes I, I, I sort of suppose I feel a bit sort of defensive about thinking of art as therapy or in some way therapeutic. I remember somebody, when I'd soon after I'd written the book, uh, Anatomy of a Soldier, my, I was at a, an event and somebody said, you know, they're basically saying, you know, how did you deal with your PTSD? And, you know, this book is, is therapy. And, um, and I said, well, it's not, that's not how it felt. And he said, no, of course it's therapy. I'm a psychologist. I can see you've had PTSD. And I said, so saying, no, I, I don't have PTSD. And I sort of, I, I sometimes feel that, um, you know, I think art can be very therapeutic, but for me, it wasn't like that. You know, I woke up in hospital having been blown up and lost both my legs. And there was a moment of, you know, well, what now? And and in a sense, I was very lucky in my education that there were lots of options open and I didn't go straight back into sort of the creative world. It took me a bit of time. I worked in the foreign office for a while and other, other um, sort of government institutions and it took me a while to get back to it. And it still was very much a sort of professional thing. It wasn't sort of, I wasn't doing it I mean, I do love it, but I, I also hate it. You know, it's quite it's quite a struggle, and I think um, it feels like the thing I do. It's not a hobby or a sort of um, it is a passion, but not in the way some people might think it is. Can I just ask, Harry? Did you do any drawing or painting while you were on tour, either you know in your first deployment or, or your second one? There was a front page article of, in the Times, and actually the, the 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 reporters who are now Anthony Lloyd who. Is the person who who sort of found Shamima Begin, but he he was in my armored vehicle for a few days, and his and his photographer, and he wrote this article, and just by luck, I it was an image of me on the front page of the Times, and I had lots of messages from one from my uncle in particular, that sort of stuck with me because he said, and it was me walking in the camp, and I had a Nyrex, one of those sort of military folders that had all my sort of you know orders in. And he, in his message, oh, so great that you've got your sketchbook <laughs> and that you're drawing. But my overwhelming experience of the army is there was just never time to draw because you were just too busy. And then, you know, the thought of getting the sketchbook out on a street corner was just, you know, just never happened because you were so busy, especially as an officer. I think you're always thinking and planning and, and uh, there was very little downtime. But I, I did do a little bit. But normally when I was sort of on watch keeper in the middle of the night, sort of doodles and sketches, there's a few I've got from a sort of diary that I, I kept. But often it's sort of plans of, um, uh, you know, a sort of contact that we'd had or, yeah, I did. I can remember right, doing a sort of cross section of a, of a Afghan compound. It's a compound is, the, is what we used to describe the sort of houses or the settlements that they lived in. Um, but no, not a huge amount. Only when I sort of came back did I reflect on it in sort of artistic way. But you have carried on doing some art, some painting. And I would just be interested to know how much you have ended up actually trying to represent war or conflict in your art, how much you haven't and why. Yeah, so uh, soon after I was injured at Headley Court, actually, so a friend of mine got in touch, said, do you want to do an exhibition? And I painted some pretty naff paintings of my time in Afghanistan. And I was sort of leaning quite heavily on photographs and I, you know, looking back, it wasn't, wasn't that successful in sort of an artistic sense. And I, and I think I just found it very hard to, um, to express how I felt about it in any way that was sort of meaningful. Um, so, so, and I, and that's probably my deficiency as a sort of visual artist. I, I could just never quite 
flick it out of something that my parents might like into something that was more powerful, <laughs> if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I think writing gave me more freedom to say what I wanted to say or explore what I wanted to explore. So you said earlier that didn't happen right away. So uh, I was curious to hear a bit more about that process. When you eventually turned to writing, when, when did it happen? When did you decide you wanted to write? Um, but also, were there any particular war writers that, that were influential for you, that, um, that, that were important to you? Or was this a more spontaneous decision that came out of your biography, so to speak? Yeah, I think it was a bit more spontaneous. There was no one I was sort of reading for, certainly there was no one from sort of war fiction or war reportage that I was really reading at the time. I think it really did, I don't know really where it came from. It was a sort of urge to start writing. I think I felt I could do something interesting. And the first thing I started writing was a pretty naff a story about, from the point of view of animals in a sort of conflict. And I went on a short writing course, a sort of week long thing at Arvon, which is a great place, Arvon writing courses, there says charity. And one of the tutors there said, this is, a, this is okay, but it's, it's, it's not great. What, but but the, what was interesting is they sort of said, why, why are you doing it from this strange point of view? Why don't you just write from your, from your own experiences, what, what, what are you doing here? And that was when I sort of, I went back to the little rooms you get in, in, on the course and I, in a sort of sweaty mess, I wrote the first chapter of the book, which is the, from the point of view of an inanimate object, because we sort of discussed you know, the reason for doing it and how far I could take this sort of altered perspective. So it's just the book started as a sort of thought experiment, I suppose, or a little short story. And yeah, it sort of went from there, I suppose. So what, what we're getting then is that there are things clearly that you want to express and want to communicate that you weren't finding that art was packing the kind of punch that you, you sort of really, really desired. So you've turned to writing in quite an experimental way. And your first novel, Anatomy of a Soldier, published in 2016, is a real tour de force. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons why we're really keen to talk to you about it on the podcast is the way that using inanimate objects, which we'll talk about a bit more in a minute, it really shakes up our habits of visualizing war in, in very striking and very effective ways. So as Nicholas has said, it tells the tale of a fictional soldier, um, but his experiences in the book very much mirror your own. So he gets badly injured on tour. And the novel then explores that traumatic event, his recovery, and then how the impacts ripple out partly for his family, his friends. But it's also extraordinary in that it looks at the events um, from the perspectives of locals on the ground, um, not simply uh, uh, the, the soldier that the story is, is ostensibly about. And it shifts backwards and forwards in time. So really reading it, it, every chapter comes from a different perspective and it's quite an extraordinary mosaic in a sense of different perspectives. It's not one linear narrative. I think we're going to unpick it quite a lot in a minute, but I wonder if the best way to introduce it to our listeners is for you to read the opening chapter, if you're happy to. Um, so would you go for it? Read chapter one to us. So I suppose the only thing that the reader really needs to know uh, when I read this is that the objects sometimes um, address the main character who's called Tom Barnes in it by his ZAT number, which is this sort of military ID number. And it, his, his, so when you hear BA5799, that is, um, that is the object addressing Tom Barnes. Anyway, chapter one. My serial number is 654501. I was unpacked from a plastic case, pulled open, checked and reassembled. A black marker wrote BA57990 positive on me, and I was placed in the left thigh pocket of BA5799's combat trousers. I stayed there. The pocket was rarely unfastened. I spent eight weeks, two days and four hours in the pocket. I wasn't needed yet. I slid against BA5799's thigh, back and forth, back and forth, mostly slowly, but sometimes quickly, bouncing around. And there was noise, bangs and cracks, high-pitched whines, shouts of excitement and anger. One day I was submerged in stagnant water for an hour. I went in vehicles, tracked and wheeled, winged and rotated. I was soaked in soapy water, then hung out to dry on a clothesline and did nothing for a day. At 0618 on the 15th of August, when I was sliding alongside BA5799's thigh, I was lifted into the sky and turned over, and suddenly I was in the light. There was dust and confusion and shouting. I was on the ground beside him. He was face down. He was incomplete. I was beside him as rocks and mud fell around us. 
I was in the dust as a dark red liquid zigzagged towards me over the cracked mud. I was there when no one came and he was alone and couldn't move. I was still there as fear and pathetic hopelessness gripped BA5799 as he was turned over and two fingers reached into his mouth as his chest was pumped up and down and they forced air into his lungs. I was picked up by a slippery hand, fumbled back to the ground and then picked up again. I was pulled open by panicked fingers and covered in the thick, thick liquid. I was placed on BA5799. I was turned. I tightened. I closed around his leg until his pulse pushed up against me and he grimaced and whimpered through gritted teeth. I was wound tighter, gripping his thigh, stopping him bleed out into the dust. I clung to him while he was lifted onto a stretcher and he bit deeply into the man, who, of the arm of the man who carried him when he no longer made any noise. I clung to him as we boarded the helicopter. I was wound again then and gripped him harder. I clung to him as we flew low across the fields and glinting irrigation ditches and the wind rushed around the helicopter. When he pleaded with God to save him and metal pads were placed against his chest and his body jolted. And I clung to him when the machine read no output, when there was no pulse against me. I was there when they ran across to the helicopter and took us into the cool of the hospital. I was there when the doctors looked worried. I clung to him when he came back, when he had outputted his faltering heart, pulsed again. I was still there when they hung a bag of blood above BA5799 and they cut the remains of his leg away. And then I was unwound and loosened and I was no longer there. BA5799 no longer needed me. My serial number is 654501. I was at the bottom of a surgical bin and then I was burnt. Thank you. There's so much to unpick there. But this first chapter really plunges us into the drama, the pivotal event in the book, the moment that Captain Tom Barnes gets injured. Although we don't know his name, as you say, we just hear about him from his serial number to start with. And the story is told by this inanimate object, which we gradually realise is a vital piece of his kit with a serial number of its own. It's a tourniquet used to stop him bleeding out while he's transferred to hospital. So, Harry, can you tell us why you decided to narrate events through these impersonal inanimate objects? Because every chapter, 45 chapters in the book, works like this, doesn't it? So there are 45 different objects that narrate the novel. I, I think the way it came about is sort of quite hard to pin down. It came about in a sort of quite weird way, said earlier, in terms of it came out of another idea and then seeing how far I could push that idea. But why it sort of seemed to feel right, I mean, the first thing was I, I wanted to write but I wanted to have some distance between myself and my story so I fictionalized it but then I also wanted to sort of depoliticize it I suppose there was a number of things going on there was it was all very political still people were sort of talking about lack of equipment and why should we be there and I and I wasn't really interested in that I, I, I wanted to think about it in a different way and then there was also people I knew who'd written memoirs about their experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan and the people who they'd served with were often, you know, I would be in conversations where people would talk about those books in a way that, well, essentially to saying that they didn't think it was right that those people were talking about their experiences of conflict. As in some way, it was a sort of betrayal of something that was shared with everyone who was in those conflicts. And the, the next, and, the, and sort of linked to that was the fact that everyone's understanding of any sort of conflict, especially when it's heightened and there's a time of combat, that everyone's experience of it was very different. Everyone remembers it, remembers it very differently. And I think I wanted some way of not betraying that or, or having some distance from what actually happened. I mean, then obviously you can fall into lots of other traps about fiction, <laughs> making things up and people believing what you've written was true when it wasn't but that's why I did it and it there, I mean there's lots of other reasons why it seemed to work um the objects I think really helped me sort of creatively keep a sort of creative interest and pace and uh, I mean when I first wrote it I imagined that the book could be printed in any order in a sense that you could throw up every all the chapters and they could land in any order a bit like a bomb so sort of form of the form of the book could sort of follow the meaning but I, I pretty quickly knew I wanted more control of the sort of fractured storyline and then there's that 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 whole thing about the sort of idea that you just never quite know where you are in time and space um when you're soldiering so you know you never quite know where the enemy is or what's happening to you or why you're there and I wanted to have I think the objects help some sense of that 
But the last thing to say is probably that the objects are hugely important, I think, when you're a soldier. They have a, you know, your body armor and your helmet. You know, those are the things that sort of protect you and your rifle um, sort of allows you to sort of go out and meet the enemy. And I mean, I always remember, you know, sort of even though my body armor was very damaged, I think it was in Iraq, I didn't want to, I didn't want to sort of trade it in for another new set because I suppose firstly it would make me look like a sort of new recruit and a lot of experiences that I'd been to were, were sort of written in the debris and dirt that was sort of ingrained in it and I do think as soldiers um, equipment becomes quite important you know we sort of have I mean it's probably different for lots of people but I suppose like one footballer might tie up his football boots the same way every time he goes out onto the pitch or do his socks up the same way it's the same for a soldier I think it might even be a bit more heightened and, and then and then I suppose medically as well as soon as you get into hospital these objects are sort of pressing into you the tubes and the, and the intubators and the blood bags they're all sort of becoming part of you and that becomes even more heightened when you think about the sort of prosthetics. So in some ways the form of the book the narration through objects reflects your experiences and perhaps other people's experiences as a soldier in terms of your reliance on equipment, the, the very close relationship you have with equipment, but also that sort of sense of fragmentation of time and space and uh, experience. But it's also, I think, these objects help you communicate some of the things that you want to communicate about conflict, because I think they alter perspectives, don't they? There's not one narrative voice that carries us all the way through. So you're always looking through one lens. You're swapping backwards and forwards. And that, I think, reflects what you said earlier, Harry, about you know, even 20 people involved in that IED blast, for example, not one of them is going to have exactly the same memory of it or the same experience of it. So these objects help capture that sense of altered perspectives, different perspectives. Is that right? I think there's about five different occasions in the book that but you sort of see them from a different perspective. So, for instance, very early in the book, I think it's the third object is a bag of fertilizer, which gets made into the IED so you see a, a situation on a road junction where where the sort of insurgent leader um, essentially intimidates one of the main characters he's called Latif and, and nicks this bag of fertilizer and you see it from the point of view of the for the bag of fertilizer and then much later in the book you see it again from the point of view of the AK-47 that the lead insurgent sort of forces into the mouth of Faradun to sort of in intimidate him. And then, and then you, I think you see it again from another point of view, the trainers that Latif buys when he sort of becomes, a, it's a sort of symbol of him becoming a, an insurgent is to buy these, these, this pair of Western trainers from a market. You know, I was very interested in the way war or certainly counterinsurgencies and sort of warfare I was ever truly involved in other than sort of training, how sort of confusing it was and how we always sort of saw it from one perspective. And I think I was very conscious that there was another side to it. You know, I think, you know, different people and different soldiers were more or less aware of that, depending on, I suppose, who they were, how they were trained, how they said their outlook of the, on the conflict and things like that. I guess for me, there are two things that are coming out of this that I find particularly interesting out of this, you know, idea of using objects as, as, um, as the perspectives, the angles through which the story is, um, the story is told. But one is from a kind of slightly more academic point of view. There is a, a kind of a growing interest in academia um, in what's called human thing relations where um, people start to realize that not everything comes out of what humans do and humans want to do and, uh, um, and how they're acting, but we, we react, we interact with things all the way through. And these things prompt us to do things. Um, they, they, they prompt us to position ourselves in certain ways. They, um, they determine how we move where we stand, what we do. So it's actually quite interesting to see this now from the, um, from the more practical side, uh, put you know, in, into a novel as, a, as, as the fundamental principle of a, of, of a narrative. For me, that's very interesting. But I'm also, I guess, thinking about something that one of our other guests was saying during the interview that there was a, a war photographer, Hugh Kinsella Cunningham, who said that uh, there's also a problem with talking about war or trying to represent war in the sense that there's, there are only so many ways in which you can represent the same thing. And it's really important to find ways that make people stop and think about these things. And I'm, I'm wondering whether your choice to go through the objects also has effect, because I suppose we've all 
in one way or another read about or looked at on TV badly injured bodies. But getting this from the perspective of the objects, I think that's really something that makes people stop. And I, I found this in many ways a, a lot more powerful than a, a graphic description uh, itself. Yeah, there's a few things there. Just creatively, just going back to your first point about the way that objects can influence us and you know may have some impact on our sort of agency, I suppose, that it was really fun to write from the point of view of an object. It can have a very strange life or route through a story. So for instance, a, oh, there's one object that's a $20 bill and I can sort of start that chapter in America where it's printed and then fly the object across and land it in Kandahar and, and then show the way it, it enters circulation through a sort of pretty grim process. It ends up being used as compensation by, by the main character, Tom Barnes, to pay for the death of, of one of the other characters. But it also then, you know, hopefully that, had, that, that also speaks to how we're connected through objects. I think in terms of the next part of what you were saying, the as I was writing, I always had in the back of my mind is that I want to create something that, that when somebody has finished, they say to themselves, oh, I never thought about it like that. And I do think with sort of depictions of war, you know, the films, video games, and even the press, you know, we become quite sort of desensitized to it, obviously, and, and that's, that's not a it's not an unusual thing to say. My feeling of a combat situation is really sort of you're sort of six inches off the floor, and all you can see is the top rim of your helmet, and the bottom is sort of grass, and then it's all noise and people shouting. Very disorientating, very loud. I think that's the thing that no one ever quite realizes how loud it is. And it's very exciting and very scary all at the same time. And I think having a way of disrupting or undermining some of those preconceptions was really useful for me to, it was just one of the most exciting things about writing it, I think, for me. So creatively was finding ways of challenging people's preconceptions, mm. surprising them, I suppose, about what war might be. And you mentioned, obviously, that the, the objects take us back and forward in time and space but we also move um, geographically a little bit there are times when the novel places us you know back in the UK before deployment times when of course the bulk of the narrative is actually on deployment you don't specify where that is although it's heavily implied that it's somewhere like Afghanistan I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about that so the, the, the not mentioning the conflict zone I suppose sort of Part of the reason was to go to sort of keep that sort of abstract, you know, how much do the objects know? And there was a moment writing it where I had to make a decision about did they ever know? I mean, they it's ridiculous, isn't it? The whole concept is ridiculous. But um, did they ever know what a character was feeling? And I tried to sort of write it in a very abstract way where you never really get reported what any of the characters are feeling. And so I had to set a number of rules about what the, the objects can sort of understand about the environment they're in. Because the objects don't really have, they're not meant to have personalities and they don't speak. They don't, they don't sort of have dialogue. Uh, I had set rules like, you know, if you're being, if they're touching a character, then they can um, they can feel what they're, they're feeling. So they were sort of rules that I set for myself that don't really matter for the reader, but sort of mattered for me in terms of holding it all together and giving it a certain atmosphere. Because atmosphere is quite important for the way I like the books I like to read and, and the way I sort of like or would like my writing to be read. And I think not mentioning Afghanistan was a little bit about that. It was about creating this atmosphere and also, you know, thinking that I was sort of trying to make it sort of timeless. And it and also goes slightly back to that political thing. It, it meant that I, I could say, well, you know, it's not Afghanistan, it's fiction. And sort of getting a bit of a get out of jail free card for me, if anyone ever asked me about, you know, what it meant or how I felt about Afghanistan, I could just say, well, it's not about that. I think that's interesting that, so these objects, the, the sort of the rules you set for yourself, partly to aid your writing, I think they do have an impact on the reader. I think there is that universal Personalizing element actually in the book through the slight detachment that they have they are showing rather than telling what war is like what conflict is like so it's not they're not simply narrating a specific conflict or a conflict um, that Captain Tom Barnes is involved with but just to come back to this question of you've got one or two objects that are connected to family members of Tom Barnes for example how did you decide how much family to bring in and how much what rules did you set yourself for um, how many objects could belong to people other than Tom Barnes, let's say? 
I suppose that was a sort of decision in how, you know, how to how wide do you want to go and how many characters do you sort of want to introduce? What's strange, I mean, one of the strange things about the book is when, is when people sort of say, you know, you know, it must have been awful for your mother when, 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 she, when they came and knocked on the door. Because the, the handbag is, is, is Tom Barnes's handbag and uh, it narrates the moment that the notification officers come to the house, knock on the door and say, your son's been very badly injured. And that's not how my mother found out. She was on holiday in France and got a phone call. And my dad was a general in the army. So the phone call was from the head of the army. I mean, it's completely un, you know, unusual way for a soldier to be notified for a phone call from the head of the army um, to his mate, basically, you know, who he served with for almost 40 years, saying, yeah, Harry's been injured. So so that, I suppose, the two things about that. One is that people people think it, that's the way it happened, and it's not. And there's a lot of, there's quite a lot of occasions in the book. You know, although there are elements of my family in it, you know, obviously it leans on my experiences heavily. It also, it also, there's lots that's fictitious and lots that's sort of simplified and lots that's made clearer for the better fiction, hopefully, to be more sort of understandable and tell a better story. Um, and was it difficult? I mean, I, I, what's, what's strange about writing it for me is that writing The Mother's Handbag, I, I wrote in the library. And if I left the library and I was sort of sweaty and shaking, which I may have been, I don't know, on the day of writing the mother's handbag but there were other times when I was creating something that was completely fictitious there's an object which is a wheelbarrow that that the father one of the characters carries their dead son in to the camp in the wheelbarrow and that felt as sort of powerful and and affected me as much as writing some of the more autobiographical and I sort of knew they were would be okay or they might be good enough if if I was feeling the same thing Interesting. Just to come back to the bag of fertilizer. So the first chapter you read out is the tourniquet that um, is wrapped around Tom Barnes's leg when he's Im- immediately injured. Uh, I do think it's very interesting that your second chapter moves straight away, immediately away from Tom Barnes. And it's voiced by this bag of fertilizer that's been bought by a young boy, um, a, a, a local boy, Afghan or not, wherever this conflict is situated, who then, as you say, gets sort of threatened at a checkpoint by the insurgents that I suppose Tom Barnes is is, is working against. And I think it's quite interesting that you move straight to that young boy's experience from the drama of the IED explosion. It suggests to me, at least, that maybe it was really important for you to look at events from the perspective of locals, you know, to balance that as much as from the perspective of Tom Barnes, is that right? How interested were you in somehow balancing the two sides of war or the multiple sides of the the conflict? Yeah, but I mean, that was absolutely part of it. And that's, I suppose, another reason that it had to be fiction. That's what I wanted to explore. And I, and I don't think I quite got there in terms of the balance. I think it is unbalanced. It, you know, I've got a notebook somewhere with all, you know, I'm trying to work it out in terms of word count on how long I spent in each strand on each character and really trying to balance it. But for lots of reasons it was it was harder to to put myself in into that world obviously and you know we, there's all those conversations about appropriation and cultural appropriation all of that that you, we probably don't need to talk about now but I was I was very aware of all of that it was it was very important for me and I wouldn't have done it without it and in fact when I was lucky enough to be in the sort of conversations with agents there was an agent who said, I think we'll cut that side of it and just keep it purely on the sort of Tom Barnes story. So I walked away from it, or I was was certainly very disappointed that they felt like that. So yes, it was hugely important because I suppose if if the book is a sort of thought experiment, it's really for me to try and understand what what happened to me and what was going on and to really come to terms with... um, the sort of conflict that I've been involved with. If you if you look at the characters in the book, uh, Faradon, whose father is the sort of local elder, is very close to me in terms of, you know, my father was in the army and there's... So I was sort of thinking about what it's like to go into the same career or job or work for your dad, not that I really worked for him, but I was thinking about those sort of feelings when I was writing that other side of the conflict and thinking really, you know, if I was born in this country, you know, would I be any different? Probably not. I'd just probably still become an insurgent. You know, that's sort of the, that was sort of the thought processes that I was going through. And you'd think that um, that sort of empathy is actually quite important 
well, not not only for the novel because it you know it, it allows the reader to kind of find other ways into your book, but it was also important to you as you were um, in in the theater of war, as you were. I mean, that was part of your job in Afghanistan in particular to sort of talk with the locals, try to understand what's going on. Something else I found very interesting beyond the question of empathy and the, the multiple perspectives is also what you were saying about how the elements that you invented are in the story and in terms of the effect that they have on you and the effect that they can have on the reader they're just as important as the ones that are based directly one-on-one -on, -one on real objects i think that's for for people like us you know, who are reading and analyzing literature all the time i think that's that's always very interesting to hear there's always a tendency to kind of break it back down to the author and is, try to find something autobiographic in in everything and th there's also this thing that uh, we were talking with a, a a colleague of ours kate mclaughlin who mentioned a thing called war gnosticism where there's this idea that you always have to sort of justify why you think you're allowed to talk about war. I suppose that also sort of um, motivates people to look for the factual and in, in everything they they find and read. It's very important, I think, to say that the, the factuality of it in, in this novel is not the most important thing for, for the novel to do what the novel is, is meant to do and can do. Yeah, and I think the sort of, I mean, I, you know, the, the authenticity, I suppose, it's the authenticity of someone who's been there and been blown up allowed me to do this. Which, and it also allowed me not to write it factually in a way because probably I think I, I think and I and there's something about the sort of truth of what you're trying to communicate sort of creatively was better was well for me was better by doing it fictitiously if that makes sense is that yeah absolutely um so that so I suppose it's a very fine line but I think probably those people who are looking for the factual might still be drawn to my book because they know mm. because of me as the person who've written it they think, oh, well, he's been there and done it. If I hadn't been there and done it, then I probably wouldn't have been able to write the book mm. anyway. No, I think that's that's right. I'm, I'm, I'm just very interested in this in this authenticity that is doesn't have a simple, uncomplicated relationship with factuality. But, you know, authenticity is much more complex than than, than to say, oh, I, you know, I've, I have evidence for, for this piece of equipment being used in that particular situation by person so-and-so. It's 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 more complex more interesting uh, well I, yeah uh, i totally agree and i think that just going back to that that idea that everyone's experiences are so diff different i mean every time we came back from a a, a a patrol we would have an after action review you know we'd have a patrol debrief and if there had been a big firefight or not even a big firefight but a firefight everyone's everyone's experience of it was complete well not completely different but different enough that it was extremely complicated and that was 10 minutes after we'd come in through the gate so it all gets pretty messy you know in terms of in terms of fact and and what was right so yeah that so so I sort of agree with you in terms of, of this book so Harry the, the start of chapter three um, begins I was taken from a box and laces were threaded through my eyes my tongue was pulled out and a man wrote BA5799 in black permanent marker that bled into my fabric and of course, this is one of Captain Tom Barnes's boots. And in fact, we get trainers and we get other sort of footwear coming in through the book. But what we see in this chapter is um, Tom Barnes gathering his equipment together, lots more inanimate objects, breaking in his new boots, phoning home to his mom to say he's about to deploy and then traveling off into the theater of war. And I just, I was really struck by that opening where the boot is both humanized and brutalized. And I was just wondering if you could say a bit about what you were trying to communicate with that very anthropomorphic uh, representation of the the pair of trait or the pair of boots at that moment you know it's it's boots have eyes and they have a tongue and they have a soul i know it's felt different but 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 it, it was and then this idea that you name it and mark it and then the the and it's sort of i just really you know i'm really i can really picture that that um that moment where you write on you know, your kit you sort of make it yours and it bleeds into all the fabric and I think the book's meant to be quite well. I hope it's parts of it are quite playful, you know, in terms of that, and 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 that's I suppose part of it being quite disconcerting as well. I hope so. So yeah, I think you know, I yeah, I, I suppose that it goes back to that thing about objects being very sort of you're know, very crucial to a soldier in terms of you rely on them, and that you know you couldn't really do your job without them. There's yeah. no way you'd go out of the gate and and face the enemy if you weren't in your 
body armor and, and your helmet on and you had your you know, they sort of give you courage really and they uh, and also they they sort of almost remind you of your training in a weird way when you put them on you you sort of can play the part in a way that is, is quite weird and you say playful but i i also wonder if there's something slightly more serious about some of what you're doing with these with these pieces of equipment in particular and that obviously the title of your book is anatomy of a soldier and i wonder whether one of the things that the book does is somehow objectify the human body in our previous episode we talked to rosie Kay, who i know you know um about her show five soldiers and one of her interests is in what war does to the human body and so I wondered if that, you know, with the fragmentation of the chapters, obviously an emphasis on bodily injury, is that one of the things you're trying to do when you get us to look at boots as if they were a body and therefore as bodies as if they're equipment and sort of object? Yeah, and it's it's really in the very first line of the book, the whole idea or the first couple of lines, you know, the tourniquet has a serial number and then so does the human, you know, so it's BA5799. Um, and I was definitely, and but for me it was more conflicted because I sort of know that the that the body, the person can be sort of object in war and in a mechanized war becomes part of this big system of systems and machines and political systems and, and the, the body sort of becomes part of that. But actually, my experience of it is it's a very human place to be as well in terms of friendships and the relationships between humans. So. As I was writing the book, I was very aware of that, the sort of tension of how I really felt about my experiences of being being some of the most human experiences I've ever had. And also this sort of something that I think people sort of place on more a bit is that the idea that the human becomes a body and also that the human becomes a sort of a, an object in warfare. But but what was interesting is actually when you what when I became when I really felt like an object was when I was sort of plugged into a wall in hospital and some of the sort of more dehumanizing experiences of being really badly injured in terms of taking away your agency and and your you know your sort of physical ability so uh, harry I, I wonder whether this might be a good moment to ask you to um to read to us another part of your book um maybe if we uh, sort of fast forward a little bit um to chapter 43 so um as others were saying there are 45 chapters and in 43, we come across the IED explosion again, something that's sort of um, comes up also in previous chapters. We we're wondering, um, would you read the start of this chapter to us? Yeah, so um, chapter 43. It banged around us and lifted you with it. Rock, mud and bone thrashed past me as I swung out around your neck on my chain. Your face was stretched in shock next to me as we existed inside the shaft of violence. It it flogged through us and you bent with it, flipping over so my chain was across your cheek and my metal discs floated up the, next to your helmet. All you felt was the flash, the dull thump and being spun and airborne in an instant. All you knew was that something was wrong. And then I clinked against the hard earth as you dropped back down from above. Sensation exploded from the bridge of your nose, overwhelming synapses and neurotransmitters and buzzing through you, too vast to be pain yet. Your body bounced and slumped as debris and rocks pattered around us. There in the dust, my two metal discs hung from your neck and rested on the ground below your chin. You were face down and your forehead pressed against the inside of your helmet, holding your face away from the dry grass. Shock annihilated everything and you were gone. So, so one thing that strikes me about that chapter, Harry, in 43, is the sort of the coming and going. So the book, as Nicola said, returns to the IED explosion again and again and as this chapter goes on the captain tom barnes kind of comes in and out of consciousness that the, the object says then you were back then you were gone again and so on and there's this sense of coming back returning and and sort of the trauma replaying and recurring and i wondered if you wanted to talk us through that a little bit is that a deliberate choice in this chapter are you trying to aim for authenticity here for what sort of really happens or is there a sort of a meta commentary going on here about the sort of the replaying of this trauma again and again you talked about not having had ptsd but i know that one of the symptoms of ptsd is the sort of replaying you know are you trying to capture that somehow or or are you aiming for a different kind of effect i mean i'm not an expert on ptsd but but I think, you know, everyone has 
post-traumatic stress after a stressful situation it's part of the natural way that we recover from trauma and I and I sometimes worry that we all whack the D on and we don't necessarily need to I think it's half of all of us will have a big trauma in our lives and about 10 percent of those will have PTSD I think the way that we deal with trauma is to sort of ruminate and think about it you know we all do that it's just how we ruminate and how we sort of go back over the ground and so I so I definitely think there was in the book you know this idea of returning again and again to these situations was a, was a, was about that sort of seeing it from different angles you know seeing seeing trauma and seeing this different situations from different angles in order to understand it not in order to be traumatized by it necessarily but to understand and try and make sense of it the book's meant to be hopeful and i and, and actually in that chapter i don't know if i was making that point that's i think that was my experience of it it was very much in and out uh, of consciousness I, you know thinking about that so but but the, you know for me the book wasn't wasn't traumatic to write it was really fun to write <laughs> um it was really creative uh you know 90 percent of the time and i think anyone who's tried to write you know you, you would have re- written your phds you know it's getting to the eighty thousand word mark or whatever it is you know there's some trauma in that anyway and then there's some real joy when you press print <laughs> and ninety thousand words i mean in fact that's the best moment of writing when no one else has seen it and it's sitting there on your desk i think that's the the moment that everyone should hold on to and they everyone thinks you should try and get it published and, and of course that is wonderful but um just just printing the thing out is pretty amazing as well i was thinking about that in the writing but in that particular chapter that i think i was just trying to get at how weird and and how dislocating that that moment was of, of sort of a being a, a sort of arrogant 26 year old man at the top of their game who felt they could rule the world treading around you know walking around in Afghanistan and then suddenly being you know a broken body you know that that's sort of that's sort of that that's what's going on there I think yeah and maybe key is really what you were saying this narrating the same incident but from these different perspectives that strikes me is very important because I, I suppose you know when, when we talk about the usual repetition that that comes with PTSD that's always from the same perspective I assume and you know where where you replay the same thing all uh, over and over and you think you know what could have done differently or what was happening here but you know these different perspectives really already take you out of this this mind cage in a way you know uh, that sort of forces you to replay that thing in 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 always the same way. Yeah and I think I I think you know I'm not an expert but I think one of the, the main symptoms of PTSD is that you, you you're not in control of it it creeps up up on you in ways that or, or happens to you and you have episodes of it where you're not you, you don't want it or, or you're not sort of prepared for it whereas in in those first few months and years I would it was very rare that I'd suddenly think about it in a way that I wasn't in control of or in control of it's a weird way of thinking but I was you know it was certainly felt more in control yeah, and I think just go the different perspectives. I don't know if this necessarily follows on from what you were saying, but one of the other motivations for the book was this idea that you'd see on the front of the papers or people would say to you, oh, the cowardly Taliban, and, you know, they fight in such a cowardly way and, and they, they dig these bombs into the ground and then we step on them. And I, I just never saw it like that because I just felt that you know, dropping a missile from a drone from 10,000 10,000 feet was was no less cowardly you know it's just different ways of fighting and just there's a and then the book makes that point a little bit because there's the idea but there's also a drone that drops drops a, a weapon and 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 that and I was trying to sort of make the point that when you look at it from a different perspective actually none of, none of it none, none of it's fair you know it's and none of it's cowardly it's just you know war war's not like that which takes us back to what we were saying earlier, these these different perspectives, which are not just the perspectives of the different objects, but also the perspectives of the different people uh, involved in the conflict uh, on, on both sides. And I think one of the things that, that follows on from that is that you're quite interested in playing around with the perspectives of all the people on the fringes, all the people looking on, the people back home, perhaps. Um, so y- you capture the narrative from the perspectives of individual objects and people involved, But in the process, you're really shifting and kind of shaking up our habits of understanding, viewing, looking on, um, because you you force us to see things from the point of view of an IED as it's being made by insurgents alongside the perspective of a soldier who's injured, who might be the one that you would immediately perhaps empathise with. 
So I think that's very in, that's very interesting sort of follow on from, you know, follow on consequence of what you're doing. So, Harry, I thought we, we've moved very close to the, the end of your book. And now we'd like to know a bit more about that. So uh, you were just reading from chapter 43, the, the injury, then chapter 44. That's a, a flag, um, one of many on a, uh, on, on a grave of, of somebody local um, that then looks out from the grave as, as the fighting recedes and uh, people start to rebuild. And then it, it's blown away and it rots in the dust. And uh, then in the final chapter, we get a running blade as, as the perspective. So Tom Barnes uh, back home, fitted with pro prosthetics, he's exercising. Then one of the blades breaks, uh, he falls. Uh, so he's not badly hurt or anything. And then the novel ends with, um, and tears came because you could, and it didn't matter anymore. It was normal. You replaced me with your other legs, shut the boot and drove to work. So can you tell us a bit about this ending? So what's going on there? Clearly, it's there's, there's a sense of closure in a way, but it's also a bit of an open ending in the sense that, you know, you, you wonder what, what's the normality now? What does it look like? So, so the what's going on is that he falls over and he, he sort of what, when you run on blades, when you fall, you fall very fast because because of the way they work. And you're trained to sort of roll up in a ball and roll but I never managed to I just put my hands out and in the book what ha what what's happening to Tom Barnes is he sort of he scrapes his hands very badly on the on the on the road surface and he goes back to his cobbles back to his car <laughs> I think what I'm trying to say is that being able to bleed again and be injured is amazing because it's sort of he's independent enough to be to have that sort of normality to have that sort of mobility and that normality so that's sort of what's going on there i think it's sort of in a sense it's it's some sort of closure from it all and then why does he go to work we went to work because life goes on doesn't it i mean you know that's that's all that's saying really it's um you know I, it's not really meant to be open-ended that i mean it's just it's it's just the reality of of soldiers i think you know they always have to have every single soldier that's ever survived conflict then has to go back and live a normal life. And I think some manage that better than others. You know, so sometimes soldiering remains the defining experience of their life. And I've seen that in people that I've served with. And it's not the case for me, I don't think. It may look like that from the outside. I mean, I walk around with prosthetics and it looks like, you know, that that, that might, but it's not how it feels to me. And I don't really talk about it very much, even though I wrote, probably because I've got it all out of my system in the book. But, um, but yeah, so I think that's what's going on. So I suppose that brings us to a broader question, which is, what are you trying to communicate with the book as a whole? Is this a book that's more about soldiering, more about war? What are you trying to communicate about either to your readers? Well, everyone should go and read the book. <laughs> no, no, what am I trying to communicate? Um, I think you've said you've said the word a few times, both of you, about empathy. You know, if there's anything that I want to do, it's that is to make a is to make somebody who's reading the book think. You know, I've never thought about it like that before. And I think, in my experience, the best soldiers that I served with were those who were most compassionate and most sort of empathetic to their own people, but also to the people that they that they were fighting and fighting for and fighting around. I mean, I suppose that's the other part of it. It was sort of I was looking at counterinsurgency is quite a strange type of warfare where at one minute you could be helping someone or talking to them in the in a market or trying to help them and the next moment you could be fighting them or someone that they know that all the strangeness around that I think I was trying to think about really. Um, so in many ways you're trying to get people to look with empathy um, and also just look with different eyes and with slightly altered perspectives. So in that sense, your book is, you know, really, really interesting for our project, which is all about the habits we have of visualising conflict, visualising particular ones, but also war in, in, in general. And I, I really do feel that, you know, having read the book myself, really got me to look at war generally, and perhaps at conflict in Afghanistan specifically, from a series of altered perspectives and, and really shaken up, shaken up my, my ways of looking. Any way that you can try and bring someone, open up their imagination so that they can understand something a bit better or see it from a slightly different point of view, I think is really important because 
as we've said earlier, that I think conflict is, in some sense, is very hard for people to understand. But also, you know, actually, it's not that far from many things that we all go through every day. So we have a slightly strange relationship to it, all of us, I think. Uh, and then when you go and do it, it's still strange. So, yeah, I think that's sort of what I was going for, that sort of idea of really opening people's imaginations up to what it might be like. So, Harry, I think the point that you were just making, the role of the book as a way of you know changing people's perspectives, opening up their minds, brings me to the question that kind of looks at beyond the book and looks at you and and uh, your experience as a as a veteran and a double amputee. So the way in which uh, people respond to you and that's a question that's interesting to us uh, not only because we are interested in war from all kinds of perspectives, including the perspective of the veteran when the war officially is over, but you know, in, in many ways, it's still shaping people's lives. And also one of our colleagues um, who's part of the Visualizing War um, group, Dr. Laura Mills, she has studied um, the impact of things like the Invictus Games and uh, how the wider public perceives veterans and especially those with uh, significant injuries. So do you feel that people visualize you, your experiences in, in particular ways? I think it's a really, I mean, it's a massive question. Everyone's experience as a veteran is very different. And I think the five to 600 odd seriously injured, I mean, there's probably a few more than that, but but the, those who were Kazavakt from Afghanistan, so what sort of 800 people um, who had who had sort of life-changing injuries are, a, are quite a small cohort who have a very particular experience. And actually, we, we just talked about PTSD and I, my, my impression was actually that that, that group Sometimes somehow had a, a sort of ready-made decompression through rehab because they wanted to go through quite a long rehab. And in that almost, I think, you know, I, that almost served as some sort of decompression. Actually, when I came back from Iraq, you know, one minute I was in Basra and then 24 hours later, I was in a pub in Southwest London. And that was much more disconcerting. And the sort of all those things you hear about sort of anger and, feeling out of place and feeling like no one understood what you'd been through I could sort of feel those things rising up in me in terms of the way people ex I think maybe view me as a veteran I I'm not sure I, I I'm pretty good at ignoring everyone now in terms of the way the way they I don't think about it very much you know about my I don't, I don't sort of identify as a as a veteran but I think I'm probably maybe in the minority and, and I think there's a lot of it depends on their background when they what age they were injured how lucky they were with their education where they went after they were injured I think there are a few veterans who've gone to gone on to do sports and other types of sort of activism is that the right word also sort of mm. um yeah and, and raising money for charities and I, and I think that's great and I and, and I, I do think there's you know it's a, it's a horrible thing to say but you can sort of become a a professional disabled person and then and that's absolutely fine and it there, there's some amazing work that's done but for me it wasn't the way to go so and it, and I but I was lucky as well I had I had other options and so, so I, I you know I went and did a master's and things like that and, and sort of changed my career I'm not sure I'm answering your question very well I mean in the street when I'm walking along probably once every few weeks, maybe once a month, someone will say, oh, were you in the army? Mm. And I'll say yes, quite grumpily and walk off. Um, and, uh, but more often than that, a five-year-old kid in the playground, because my children are that old, oh, will come and stare and say, oh, what happened to you? What, what's happened to your legs? So I spent quite a lot of time sort of explaining that with their mothers sort of hovering, looking rather shocked when I eventually tell them that I stood on a bomb because they keep asking me <laughs> how I did it or well, my daughter will tell them I could talk about that for hours in terms of identity and how mm. how it has affected my life it's it's quite hard to sort of put my finger on but essentially yeah. I don't see it anymore I think it's interesting again it goes back to something that uh, Professor Kate McLaughlin talks a little bit about that the, 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 the general public sometimes wants to impose an identity on you and there's quite an ambivalence about veterans as heroes but as I think Kate has put it the minute they do something wrong as potentially delinquents as well and it goes back to some of what you were saying about a sort of slight 
ambivalence about war and soldiering and, and conflict more generally, the, the sort of mix of distance and proximity, this idea that soldiering and war is very, very, very different from what civilians ever get up to, but actually sometimes there are some overlaps as well. Yeah, I, I think there's something really interesting in the types of conflict that I went to and the cohort we've just been talking to go go to, probably understand it better than I do, but you know, the, the First and Second World War were, were national struggles. They were existential threats to our country. Everyone was involved in some way or knew somebody very intimately who was involved. Um, it affected their lives massively. Fast forward to these post 9-11 conflicts where there was nowhere near as many casualties, but the political reasons for going were much harder <laughs> For the public to understand and i think in that there became you know the, the the injured soldier so somebody like me became the victim that certain groups could sort of say look at our poor boys and bash the government over the heads with partly for good reasons to sort of raise money and things but as the soldier as the as the victim that's not a great place i mean some of my worst experiences of since having been or, or the sort of experiences where you get home and feel most empty were where I had to stand on a stage and do the sort of open your wallet speech at some fundraiser. I, I hate it. So, so there's that side of it in terms of, um, yeah, the, 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 the veteran become, was used differently. And then there's the other part of it where we're in a sort of age of the cult of the personality. So the, the double amputee has a story that is sort of Instagrammable, let's say, and can be on the front of the sun. And, and that's very different from what my grandmother always said to me, and which was one of the reasons when I wrote the book, I was sort of thinking, should I be doing this or not? That her, her father had never spoke about his experiences in the war. And it was, you know, very un-British to, to sort of spill your guts. So that was a bit, I was a bit conflicted as well. And, and that's probably another reason that it ended up being so weird. And, and I wasn't, it was another way of being, I suppose the whole book may be a sort of stiff upper lip British thing, you know, do it without without um, being too sort of emotional about it. It was a way of sort of emotionally sidestepping or, a, yeah, sidestepping the emotion that I might, you know, that I might have about it, if that makes sense. Hmm. That's the interesting thing about this, right? You, you get the emotions in through the inanimate objects because i think it would it's yeah maybe it's not a direct sort of access to the emotions but it's a uh, this indirect way of unlocking the emotional potential of what's going on that's very effective it's maybe even more effective than well that's saying. what i yeah, yeah that's what i thought i thought actually it heightens the through the through that yeah. lens the emotion gets heightened for me anyway because yeah it gets filtered out and then it becomes more universal maybe hopefully so uh, harry before we end can we come back to your art once more? So you, you did the artwork, I think, for Soldier On, a play developed by Jonathan Guy Lewis, who will be our guest on the podcast next week. And in terms of your future plans, do you think you'll do more art? Or will you be doing more writing? So what's in, what's in the pipeline now for you? So, yeah, I'm just I'm just finishing a book, which I hope will be published. It's for the, it's for the Welcome Collection. I mean, it's all quite weird at the moment uh, with the pandemic and... But I think hopefully it will publish in March 2022. That's the plan. And it's it's been great fun to write, but it's a book about how technology can repair and replace the body and, and what impact that has on, on, on us as, as humans. So it's quite a sort of wide ranging book, but it's very much focused on my own experiences of the last 10 years, really, of getting used to prosthetics, but also meeting other people who are very dependent on technology. That sounds very interesting. Harry, it has been fantastic talking to you. Thank you so much for giving us your time and for introducing our listeners to your novel, Anatomy of a Soldier. Um, listeners, you can buy it at all good bookshops and you can also find out a bit more about Harry's work, including his next book um, on human hybrids by visiting his website, harryparkerstudio.com. Thank you, Alice and Lucas. It's been great. It's been really fun and um, yeah, really yeah, it feels quite a long time ago since the book, so it's been uh, it's been nice to talk about it and think about it again with a bit of distance from it as well. Yes, thank you, Harry. It's been great to have you on the show today, Harry. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you, our listeners, for joining us again. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Harry Parker as much as we have. And this podcast is actually part of a trilogy of connected episodes. So Harry knows Rosie Kay, our guest last week.
And in fact, his experiences in Afghanistan inspired parts of the dance show, which she has produced called Five Soldiers. And Harry also knows next week's guest, Jonathan Guy Lewis, a well-known actor, playwright, and also artistic director of the Soldiers Arts Academy. So we will be talking to him about his play Soldier On that we already mentioned before briefly, among other things, and about the work that the Soldiers Arts Academy does in giving veterans access to the creative arts. So do join us next week for what we hope will be another fascinating discussion. If you would like to support our project, please share and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you use so you don't miss an episode. Please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find the show. And if you'd like to join the conversation further, you can follow us on social media, just search for Visualising War, or get in touch directly by emailing us at viswar at Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Young and the show was mixed by Sophia Gertin. Thank you for listening.